Good morning. Is this on? Yep. <coughs> um, Robin and I just looked at each other in the last, uh, the strongest memory we have of that hymn, I Exalt Thee, was standing in Jerusalem in Pilate's palace, what was left of it, and we just read the story of Jesus being flogged and beaten and falsely tried and from down in the cellar beneath us there was another group of tourists there or pilgrims perhaps and they were singing that hymn in another language but we knew what they were singing and up from the underneath us came this beautiful song I exalt thee man that is one place to learn that song to think of Jesus, you know, beaten, crowned with thorns, spat on. Uh, why wouldn't you want to exalt a king like that? Seriously. Let's pray. Father, uh, help us today to hear the voice of your spirit. And as we've just sung, that our hearts might break with what breaks your heart, Lord Jesus. And... As we open your word, that your word would open us and show us what we are and what we need to do and what we can be. Amen. Well, these, the setting for this uh, story today that uh, we're going to look at, um, if fellas could put the first slide up, that would be good. And... Uh, you can see that's a, what it looks like standing on the Mount of Olives, looking back towards Jerusalem. City wall outside, and then in the centre there, you see what was left of Herod's temple that was flattened by the Romans in AD 70. And there, that gold dome in the centre is the Muslim mosque that's been placed right there. And right this moment, if there's a flashpoint in the world today, this minute, that's where it is. I read, astonished this week, that there have been more bombs dropped in Gaza than the whole of the Second World War. Can you believe that? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Extraordinary. What times we're living in. And people who try to tell you the Bible's out of date need to do their homework. Because this moment uh, is not just a Bible reading that you've heard. This is the voice of Jesus himself giving us a picture of how it will end. In that temple, and you can put the next slide on, um, there's a closer view of the, the temple. This is looking across from the west towards the east, and that's the Mount of Olives in the distance. Um, and there's the temple in the centre. And if you put the next slide on, um, that's looking from the Mount of Olives back again. And those square things in the middle there, at the, in the foreground, are graves. And that's where a lot of Christians have had themselves buried there on the Mount of Olives, expecting that they will be the first to take off when Jesus lands there. <laughs> that's why they've been buried there. It's quite extraordinary. Um, but it's a place full of expectation. Two-thirds of the world's population looks to, looks to this point. Christians, Muslims, Jews are all focused on that place at this point in time because that is the centre of their faith. The Muslims believe that's where Muhammad ascended to heaven from. The Christians believe that's where Jesus will return to. And the final slide, and we'll leave this one on, sets the scene. That's what Jesus would have been looking at, sort of, the, the remains of the temple there, but it would have been a beautiful white building, marble. It was one of the wonders of the, modern, of the ancient world built by Herod, took 40 years, and there it is. And there's Jesus sitting on the mountain with his four disciples. 
John, James, Peter and Andrew, the first fishermen that he called, uh, looking back across towards the temple. It's Passover and it's a very, very tumultuous time. You've got to remember that Israel was the only group of people in the world who had a linear sense of history, that is, that it was going in a direction with a destiny. Most people in the world, well, the Romans who were there at the time as the invaders, their gods were pretty much disinterested in the human race. Uh, they didn't really care much what happened on earth. But of all the people in the world, the Jews brought to our human understanding that there was a, the God of heaven was very interested in what was happening in his world and it did matter what you did today and what you did tomorrow and the next day. Everything mattered and that it was going to a conclusion. And that makes a lot of difference when you believe that the, that the whole of history is moving to a great conclusion. And as, his, as Israel's history unfolded, the prophets were making it clearer and clearer of what this end would look like. They called it the day of the Lord. God was going to intervene. It was going to bring things to a conclusion. The fractured, broken, sinful world was not going to last forever. It had a use-by date. And God was going to establish his reign and his kingdom again because it was his world and he had every right to do that. And while we sit in his world doing what we think is <laughs> the right thing, it's a long way off base and we've got a lot to learn. And we need to think and listen very carefully this morning because this is the author of the universe speaking to us. 1,400 years had gone by since Moses led the people out of Egypt and here they are celebrating again the Passover, the moment when Israel left Egypt and the angel of death fell on the Egyptian people and those who ignored God's warning and it was only the blood of the lamb that sheltered them and set them free and they, they followed Moses out and there was a great deliverance. And so they're repeating that. Again, pilgrims have come from all over the world. Probably the, the, the population of Jerusalem had doubled. Uh, Josephus, the historian, tells us a little bit later that at least a quarter of a million animals were being slaughtered this week during Passover. The blood was flowing down the gutters of the temple. This massive enterprise was <laughs> rolling on after 1,400 years. They're still remembering this this event. Why? Because they believed there was going to be a final great deliverance. And so when Jesus comes down from the north, from Galilee, with his little band of men, um, he's on a mission. He said, this is it. This is zero hour. Get ready. The kingdom of God has arrived. Not once upon a time in a distant galaxy far, far away, the kingdom of God has landed. Jesus is here as the king in disguise. And so Jesus makes this spectacular entry into Jerusalem. Thousands of people there welcome him. He provokes the temple authorities, the leaders of Israel, and argues with them day after day and beats them in every argument. They are so incensed they're planning to kill him. And so while Jesus is sitting here talking to these four men, looking down across Jerusalem, in that temple there, in headquarters, the leaders of Israel are planning to murder him. And he knew it. And he was willing to face them. And in a couple of days' time, they're going to try him with false accusations. They're going to beat him, spit on him. Herod's going to put a mockery of a, 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 robe, a, a royal crown and a royal robe on him. And he's going to stand before Pilate, the most powerful man in Israel, the, the representative of Iron Fist of Rome, and he's going to defy them all. One by one, Jesus will stand before them. And he's not intimidated by the most powerful men of the time. Caiaphas, Herod, Pilate, he's not intimidated. He's not there even worried about them in particular. He's come on a mission. He's going to take out the devil. He's there to defeat Satan. He's going to break the power of darkness. He's going to make sure that the kingdom of God will come. 
This is a precipitous hour. This is the most important moment in human history. And we're listening to the words of the man, the, man, the, the servant king, who had walked for three years doing good all over Israel, healing sick, lifting up the lame, restoring eyes and bringing joy to weddings, <laughs> bringing the dead out of the grave. What an extraordinary life. It's zero hour on the Mount of Olives. You need to picture this incongruous situation, the spectacular temple, and on the mountain opposite, a penniless carpenter from Nazareth, one of the most despised towns in Israel, with four Galilean fishermen, uh, <laughs> um, calmly and precisely declaring the end of the world. That is amazing, <laughs> uh, in very clear terms, calmly. He tells them he will return as king with an angelic army to call all the nations to account. Can you picture this? Imagine you were Peter or Andrew or John or James. <laughs> I mean, this is breathtaking stuff, isn't it? Like, who else says this? Who in history has ever dared to say these sort of things? And yet, you, you would think, this guy is a megalomaniac. He is out of his mind. He is insane. It's crazy. There's no two ways about it. This is the wildest kind of stuff that possibly is. Declaring there'll be calamities in the skies, you know, earthquakes, um, a falling away of, of belief, um, just disaster spreading, rippling across the world and coming to a great conclusion and he will be the focus of it. It's extraordinary. Now he's either a megalomaniac or he's, he's crazy, he's, he's like a Hitler or a Stalin or whatever, or he's something else. And the record we have of Jesus' life is that he was extraordinarily sane. If there's ever been a sane person in history, it's Jesus. <laughs> he has an amazing way of reading people and calling them out, of speaking truth that's still echoing around the world today and billions of people follow him. And I say to you, if he's insane, we're in trouble. This is the sanest verse, voice in history. And listen to what he's saying. Uh, because this will determine our destiny. He's saying the kingdom of God has arrived. And he joins with Israel's prophets who for the last 700 or 800 years have been predicting this day of the Lord, this, that the dark age will finish. This present evil age, Jesus said, is over. It's going to finish and I am calling it to, to an end. And he soberly foresees the destruction of this magnificent temple in front of him. And by AD 70 it had happened. The Romans came in and wiped the whole city out. Worldwide calamities, the persecution of his followers, false prophets, apostasy, spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, through Africa, through India, China, the Pacific Islands, the Americas, Australia, the gospel will go out. He sees this sitting on this mountain. He said, this, this news, this good news I've been preaching is not just a local thing, it's going to explode across the globe. It's going to, the kingdom of God will come. And it's happened right here in this church. That's why you're here. And we need to sit up and take notice, don't we? Because um, you can't be mildly interested in what we've heard today. The kingdom of God will never be brought by the mildly interested. This either grips your heart and becomes the thing that transforms you from the inside out or you might as well pack up. Because this is the defining statement of history. Listen carefully. Alarm bells are sounding. This towers over everything. 
And the alarm bells might have been ringing for a while in 2,000 years, but that doesn't mean it's still not going to happen. And this is not the time to cower in the trenches. We're not to say, oh, quick, bad, bad things are going to happen, we better hide. No, it means we've got to be on the front foot. We've got to be, it's a call to action in the world. This is the voice of the author of the universe who's been walking the earth as a humble servant king, describing how he will measure the way human beings have been, inv have been investing their days on earth. That's you and I. And he delights in coming incognito. Even his disciples haven't grasped it yet. And what right does he have to judge us? Well, he knows that in three days he'll be betrayed and deserted and falsely accused and flogged and spat on and mocked and crucified and then the judge of all the earth will be nailed on a cross. And that's the platform from which he will judge the world. The crucified Jesus will have the right to call sinners to attention because God has given everything he said. God loved the world so much he gave his only son. And there he'll be wounded, bruised, alone and friendless but he's certain that he's going to come to life again. And not only that but that after the resurrection Jesus said he will continue to make his appearance in disguise. He'll be a beggar hungry for food. He'll be a naked outcast who needs clothes. He'll be somebody sick and helpless who needs a healing touch. He'll be a lonely prisoner hoping for a visit. He'll be a despairing brother or sister who needs comfort. He'll be an enemy begging for mercy. He'll be a stranger anxious to be welcomed. He'll be a suicidal neighbour longing for a word of hope. A failed sinner looking for salvation. He'll be a refugee searching for a home and a friend. He'll be an addict seeking deliverance. He might be a sex worker looking and longing for genuine affection. He might be a young man or woman battling with depression and longing for light. He could be that broken businessman or woman desperate for redemption. He could be that widow or orphan that needs comfort and care. He could be an aged person simply wanting help around their home. Men and women and children of different languages and skin colours looking to be embraced as friends. But one thing is clear, crystal clear. You won't be able to pick him. But it will matter the way you treat him. Jesus, the king, the judge, says that so sustained omission will have serious consequences. Carelessness, neglect, hard-heartedness, busyness, laziness, prejudice, Blindness, superiority, contempt can be as serious as murder, rape or genocide. And so Jesus has called us along with Peter and Andrew and John and James who were sitting that, on that hill looking over Jerusalem that day saying, I want you to go into all the world with this good news. There's a kingdom that's come. It's been prepared from before the world began. It's full of joy and forgiveness and grace, feasting and mercy and music. Why wouldn't you want to be part of it? Why wouldn't you want to invite other people in? 
And if you've got that clear in your mind, as Jesus did, then nothing will stop you. His spirit will empower you. John laid it out a few decades later in his letter. By this we know the love of God, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. I wonder if he had this moment in mind when he wrote, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, but closes his heart of compassion from him. How can the love of God remain in him? My little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and in truth. And redeemed living, <laughs> people living like this that Jesus said, they will be the building blocks of the new temple, the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom of God. We made up of people like that, with hearts full of love and kindness and willing to sacrifice themselves for one another, reaching out to those in need. Jesus said that will be what he's looking for on the day of judgment. Not did you get your orthodoxy right? Was your theology square? You know, did you believe this, that or the other doctrine? Did you do this for the least of these? Then you did it for me. That's pretty sobering. Are you listening? 53 years ago... Um, I was a young man in a church in Epping in Sydney and a man called Laurie McIntosh was visiting. He'd been on mission, on mission in England with Campus Crusade. He'd been a linguist working in Mexico, a converted engineer that God had changed his life because another engineer sat him down and showed him the big picture. That God had a plan for the whole of history and it just transformed his life. He thought, if this is true, if this is real, I've got to live this, I've got to make that front and centre in my life. And so Laurie never flinched from true north in his mind. And for the next 60 years, um, he lived that way. And he spoke to me and to Robin as young students. And he made it clear that the, what the call of the gospel was. And I stood at his open casket last weekend down in Bendigo, looking at him, and I thanked him for the moment that he stepped into my world and said, live life then with a due sense of responsibility. Not as those who don't know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time, despite all the evils of these days. Be filled with the Spirit. Have your eyes wide open to the mercies of God. Give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable to him. Prove in practice that God's will for you is good. And we thank God for that man who became our mentor for the thing that you've been hearing about this morning. Somebody who bothered to step into our lives and said, follow me as I follow Christ. Do this. And last weekend we heard story after story after story of the impact of his life all over the world. Tens of thousands of people probably in the end who heard the good news because he took it seriously. <laughs> he heard Jesus say, as much as you do this for the least of these, my brothers, you do it for me. And that was the heartbeat of Cornerstone. That's why we began. I oh, thank God uh, for a brother like that and it transformed our lives. He challenged us to live as if the truth was central. And last weekend, Robert and I, as we drove away, we renewed our promise, or began it at the, at the side of his casket, actually. I looked at him and said, Laurie, I thanked him and I said, and I promise that I will, with, before you and the Lord Jesus, I will finish what we began. I'll give my best. We will give our best. 
we won't <clears throat> sit down and think we've done enough. But we want to finish full of running. Because this task is enormous, it's beyond us, but it needs God's people to take it seriously. And so for us here today, um, I hope that this begins an ongoing conversation in this church. We've talked about, you know, uh, Mitch has been leading us through the, the survey and what our goals are going to be and we're talking about building a new building and they're all good things. But it won't mean much unless we do this that we read this morning. And I want you to think right now about are you doing for the least? And I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying what Jesus said. And who are the least around you? You know, when I walk in here, I just see them doing it again. My two brothers sitting near the back door there. The first thing I see when I walk into this ch church is those two brothers. They've got their limitations, sitting in a wheelchair, and they wave, you know, and they smile, you know. That's what they give. They lift my heart coming in here. They're giving their best. Thank you, brothers. And that's what it takes. That's what will transform this church. We haven't done an enough yet. I'm not trying to burden you. I'm just saying, listen to the voice of Jesus. Have you invited strangers in? the brothers and sisters that are filling our congregation here from different countries with different coloured skin and maybe different language. Have you welcomed them into your home? Have you made them feel they are a brother, they are a sister? Have you listened to their stories? Have we listened to their stories? We need to hear from those brothers and sisters. We need to hear stories and anecdotes, real things that are happening amongst us from this platform. I say this to you elders kindly, we need to hear these stories. This will make us rich. This will ignite our hearts to do for the least. As much as you did this for the least, Jesus said, you did it for me. My mother was dying and uh, almost on her last breath, you know, and the family members were gathered there and uh, my mother had had dementia for nearly 10 years, so she really hadn't had much chance to do anything, uh, speak, you know. But as she was dying, a stranger walked in. Well, he was sort of a stranger. We knew him from when we were young. He was my age. and hadn't seen him in 40 years. He, was, he had schizophrenia. And um, so he'd struggled through life. He suddenly appeared... <laughs> He was visiting his father in the same home and it was sort of an embarrassing moment in some ways, a bit tense. He walked straight in up to the bed and he peered closely at my mother and he said, I know this woman and we were <laughs> a bit astonished and uh, it was a bit edgy and he said, yeah. I remember when we were 12 years old, he had a twin brother, when Philip and I were 12 years old, we came to your place and your mother made us a birthday cake. I've never forgotten that. Why would she do that for boys she didn't know? Then he walked out. It was like a little exclamation mark on the end of my mother's life to say, as much as you do this for the least of these, my brothers, I'll remember it a cup of cold water in my name. That's the kingdom of God. That's the reality that needs to be filling this church, filling our lives every day, woven into the context of whatever we're doing in our business or in our workplace, our homes. That's what will transform us all, God willing. Father, thank you for this astonishing story, this amazing challenge, this alarm bell this air raid siren that's saying, get ready. The kingdom of God has arrived. I want you to take this kingdom to the world and to live it out. Thank you for the privilege. Fill us with your spirit and help us to fill this church 
with the love of Christ. Break our hearts, Father, with the things that break yours, the lost and lonely and broken world, that we might be your agents, moving into those spaces and places to bring transformation, grace, mercy, forgiveness and healing and hope. For Jesus' sake, amen.